uh, while these guys are getting situated, can we get another round of applause for Dora Hacks? This has been a pretty fantastic event, am I right? Big shout out to the team. Give a wave back there, Dora Hacks guys. You guys are killer. Um, thanks to everyone putting on the panel, the moderating here. It's been a fantastic event. Keep an eye on that. It hasn't started yet, so I think we've got a lot of time. But thank you guys for coming to our IBC for App Chains panel. My name is Adam Mosny. I head up community for Overclock Labs, the creators of the Akash Network. Is everyone here familiar with Akash Network? Just want to see real quick. Everyone, all right. Whoever didn't put up your hands, you got to go to the networking area because you guys you got to get up. You got to talk to our booth over there to get up, up to speed on what's going on. But um, I want to thank you guys for joining. We got a bunch of topics to cover, so I kind of want to jump right into the introductions. So let's kick off with introductions. Feel free to introduce yourself, talk about your project, and um, what do you think about DoorHacks App Chain Day? <laughs> right. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I go by Muto. Uh, we're building Ethos. Ethos is the restaking and coordination layer on top of Cosmos. So we're working tightly with Eigenlayer in order to bring in restaked ETH to Cosmos, um, and then working through various forms of shared security security into Cosmos to secure proof of stake chains and also just general applications built on app chains. Um, I think so far the best part of this event has been this panel right here, so I'm excited to kick it off. Uh, I'm Dean Tribble. I'm CEO of Agoric. Agoric is a you know Cosmos-based uh, layer one chain for doing smart contracts in JavaScript, especially for doing that so it can, can control, coordinate all of the asynchronous accessible assets on all these other chains. So it's IBC native with the ability to, to control assets from other chains, you know, from Akash when we get ICA, um, to, you know, on through Osmosis and Tia and Axelar and so forth, and make it very easy, very convenient for developers to make these user-friendly applications um, that, 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 that combine and, and, and let you bridge applications to use multiple chains. Thanks. Um, my name is Robin. I am co-founder of Abstract. Abstract is an interchain application platform. Uh, it's built with Cosmosm. We do a bunch of IBC stuff uh, in the background, but we try to make it really easy for developers to create applications uh, with Cosmosm and with IBC. Uh, we have two components to our platform. We have the developer-facing uh, infrastructure, SDK, and we have the user-facing platform where developers can publish their applications uh, and we're really trying to level the playing field of the permissionless uh, smart contract chains. I'm Karel, founder of Union. We do ZK IBC. That means IBC to Ethereum, to Celestia L2s, uh, to Scroll, to basically anything that has any significant uh, security behind it. Uh, right now, we're probably the most prominent builders here with, I think, the only production-ready implementation uh, launching soon. Excellent. Thank you for that, guys. Um, so we have a handful of things to cover here today. We only have about 27 minutes, so I kind of want to jump right into it. Uh, but I thought it'd be good to kind of level set, which is a high-level description of IBC, right? And I want to get your guys' thoughts on if this description makes sense to you, pretty high level. But for folks that maybe aren't as familiar, uh, now is the time to do it. So IBC, or inter-blockchain communication, is a protocol spe specification that enables different blockchain networks to communicate and transfer data and assets between each other in a decentralized manner. Essentially, it allows for interoperability among independent blockchains, enabling them to exchange information and value seamlessly. <sighs> Does that feel right? Would anything, any color you want to add to that? Is that a pretty good high-level description of uh, what do you think IBC is? Yeah, um, I mean, I think that is a very technical description. Um, I mean, I think in general, like, the, the thing that I think is most important, and this is like a little bit trite, but it's really the kind of uniformity or the standard of IBC. And I think really when, when we at Ethos, when we talk about building for Cosmos, what we're really talking about is building for IBC. And it's really around kind of leveraging this kind of idea that if you can build once for this implementation, and obviously IBC is a standard, so as long as you implement it with the client types, um, you can essentially get access to all these different kind of components. And I think that's what's most important for us, so that we're not doing these one-off integrations and we can kind of get this interop and then utilize other kind of protocols kind of down the line here um, very composedly. So the main color I'll add is IBC is TCP or gRPC for blockchains. That's it, right? It's, it's this transport layer that lets you do a lot of protocols on top, application-specific protocols, chain-specific protocols, creates this connected world of app chains that now we have to orchestrate across. We need to be able to program these things and span them, but it's basically the TCP that gives us the interchange. 
Any, anything else to add to that? Or is that feels like Dean nailed it? Next I, time I, I'm going to have you write the description, Dean. Yeah, <laughs> Dean nailed it. Uh, I just want to add that um, because it is such a nice protocol, it's also very easy to uh, create abstractions for it and to kind of hide it away from, uh, from the developers and the users uh, to really create novel applications on top of it. Great, cool. Um, so I kind of want to get into some benefits. So from your guys' vantage point, what are some of the benefits of IBC and how does each of your projects leverage those benefits? Yeah, I, I already kind of talked about some of the benefits, but I guess the last one that I would also point out specifically for Ethos is um, basically being able to add to it because it's a standard and being able to add like alternative consensus models and adding alternative proof uh, mechanisms. And I think that becomes quite important. Obviously, ZK is one big uh, kind of component of that, but also alternative consensus models is also something uh, pretty big on our mind. Yeah, I think a lot of people talk about the UX component of standardizing it. For Union, IBC, it's basically chain abstraction. It allows us to abstract over the different security models, the consensus, uh, which can vary extremely between different chains. And so really it's kind of the first step into true straight chain abstractions, where you kind of see individual validator sets as just this homogenous swarm that settles. And to allow us to build products on top that kind of lead to what I think is the next generation of Web3. Uh, in Web2, at some point, we stopped connecting to data centers specifically, right? You don't connect to a website in a country. It's just a swarm of clouds that you connect with. And Web3 has to move there as well. Blockchains have to become a swarm of settlement and compute. And IBC is really what allows us to build that layer on top as the abstraction layer that then you guys can then build against. So for us, we're really at kind of the lower level there, really tightly against the security and the consensus. He brought up chain abstraction, which is worth noting here. Also, there's a chain abstraction day tomorrow for people when they're done here. Um, chain abstraction is sort of this idea of, you know, I want user experiences to move seamlessly across chains. That you can seamlessly use assets and services on different chains. That's a really important vision. It's a simple user experience, and it's incredibly hard to create. Right? One of the things that IBC brings is, is it IBC and modular and rollups they create this, this ecosystem, interchain security, right? This ecosystem of a gazillion chains, a gazillion services, a gazillion assets, all connected with IBC. That's an amazing step forward. And one of the important points with respect to AppChain Day, right, is we have won, right? App chains are a thing. We succeeded. And Woo. now we have the, yeah, yeah, everyone cheer. We succeeded at AppChains, right? right? That is awesome. We have, you know, everything from Osmosis to, you know, gaming platforms, everything else. Um, but that now creates, from the user's perspective, a thousand things that they have no idea where to start. And, you know, or portfolio management where, you know, Osmosis is great, but it doesn't have perps. I want to use my perps over here. My, you know, and so how do you program that? I, you know, the next level after we've now connected with IBC is orchestration of all that activity. And that's, that's, that's a thing that several people here bring, and that's the step we need to go to from here. So I'm gonna go a little off of my questions here, and this is a dumb question, but there are no dumb questions, right? You know, I think somebody out here, maybe me, wants to better understand this. Uh, how exactly is new features, functionality, upgrades made to IBC? Like, who manages IBC? So that is something that we kind of struggle with a bit because IBC right now has a little bit of a monolithic development pipeline that's very foundational uh, through different ADRs and such which means that so far it took a bit longer to kind of release IBC and innovate on top of it. So with Union, for example, we take the route of rapid experimentation. We actually don't go through a proposal process, but implement the new features we want ourselves to see if it's feasible. So for example, more recently, we wrapped up the scroll integration, which uses conditional light clients, something that's still in the proposal stage for IBC, but right now for us, actually feasible and doable. I think that's for kind of app chains altogether, the next step in the evolution of the Cosmos protocol. We kind of need to go a bit away from the original founders that now run large companies and have app chains innovate themselves on the core technology stack. I think that's so great about Agoric, like you guys do this. Let's get you guys ethos as well. If you don't align with the hub, but with Ethereum, but do bring in the tech stack. And that's what kind of gonna allow the Cambrian explosion of future products. There are multiple, I mean, the nice thing about open source, the nice thing about decentralization is there are multiple groups pushing in different dimensions on IBC, right? From, from the relayers that are, at, that are adding the features to enable them to be financially successful, the you know, PFMs, the, you know, all these kinds of things. There is a group that meets on a regular basis that has membership from every, you know, from, from 
old guard cosmos folk, right? To, to you know, to new teens. There are groups that are just going off and experimenting themselves, and then going, "This works. Get on board." And then the group that's kind of doing the evolution incrementally goes, "Yeah, I guess we need to go do that. Let's get that in." And so it does evolve over time. People that want to participate, they can absolutely participate and uh, and and contribute. Interop protocols are hard. Inter evolving interop protocols must take into account preserving what used to work. There are plenty of features and plans and roadmap going forward already, but that's the kind of place where people can come in, see what's there, get involved, help steer it, help implement it. You know, the old, the old uh, adage that, that, that we have, cypherpunks write code, right? Come in and help build IBC, and that's how you define the standard. Yeah, the, the only thing I would just add is I, I think there's an interesting component of ethos as well as being a validation coordination layer where we can also just be an experimentation layer. Where if you have a bunch of validators running similar chains, or at least they have a lot of interop between these chains, you can start to think about like, oh, if I want a new standard for IBC, maybe I can just implement it in my little zone and then kind of expand from there. And so I think that's really something that we're also considering for consumer chains. Yeah, and I would even expand on that um, and say that when you use IBC in Cosmosm, what you're really doing is defining your own interchain standard. So you know ICS20, that those are token transfers. Um, but with Cosmosm, you can take control, full control of the data that is sent uh, through IBC. So you can really experiment with different uh, protocols very quickly without having to do chain upgrades. Uh, so that's something unique about Cosmosm. I mean, the, 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 that what we call dynamic IBC, right? You've got the layer underneath, which is the TCP. Protocols out there, application protocols, use TCP, but there's a, there's a layer above, which is the application protocol. HTTPS is an application protocol on top of TCP underneath, right? You know, there's, and, and so that's exactly right. Inside of WASL, inside of Agoric, inside of any extensible system, you can come up with your own application protocol, just like transfer, just like MRP transfer, just like the, you know, a, a lot of these, these, these mechanisms, and many applications do so. And that's part of the value and power of IDC. And I think that's also kind of the real power of IBC compared to other intro protocols. Because we kind of have a shared standard at the lowest layer, we can all experiment on our own without the added kind of complexity overhead for developers to think about the different guarantees. If at the lowest level we had different security guarantees, then the kind of possibility of composing all of the experimentation that happens would become impossible. Right now, I can start swapping out different SDK stacks, different providers, but still have the same underlying security over the assets. And that's really the foundation of IBC, like start off with this kind of shared assumption on security and then experiment on top of it in another layer. So the short answer is, who manages IBC? It's in all of our hearts. <laughs> that's what I heard there. Um, well, you talked on, I'm actually going to skip a question and go right to security. You mentioned security. Um, so this is kind of a two-parter. But uh, what are some security considerations when implementing IBC for app chains, especially regarding the transfer of assets and data between different chains? And maybe if kind of like another frame for it is, how do you envision app chains depending on or utilizing each other for better security slash UX? Um, so first of all, if you're working on IBC or implementing it, it hasn't been hacked before. So if you're gonna make a mistake and be the first, that's a forever shame on you. And so it's one of the biggest stake games out there. Um, with securing on IBC, you inherit the security of the underlying chains. There's no third-party intermediary added on top. And that's a great quality because basically we have the highest level of security that we can get. Obviously, there's still the cases for smaller chains, for example, which don't have a lot of stake associated with their validator sets, which means that even if you're doing IBC, that doesn't mean that you're automatically secure because it's tied to that validator stake. Now, there's a few solutions to this. One is execution proof. It basically means that we move app chains towards a more like CK rollup model. Another one is solutions like shared security, where you use the hub or ethos to increase the security portion of your chain, which then in turn secures IBC again. Um, outside of that, there's some talks of experimentation with like multi-sig IBC or Oracle-based IBC. I'm personally not a big fan of that because that once again hampers composability. Right now, you don't need to think about different IBC channels. They'll give you the same guarantee if you're building the SDK on top. The moment we start adding these like different types of IBC with different verification backends, we do lose that composability portion. One of the things that is worth remembering about IBC, I mean, and worth celebrating, there are things that people do on a routine basis. I launch a new chain, I'm gonna take that token over to Osmosis or Shade Software, what have you, and make a pool, right? I'm gonna go talk to, to Umi and get a lending thing there. I'm gonna go, you know, whatever, I'm gonna bring it over to Agoric, get it as collateral for IST, right? 
Um, and, and we do that so easily and so routinely, but these are press announcements on other chains, right? These, these are hard on other chains, and these are vulnerable because they have a three of five multi-sig where two guys are in the Bahamas or whatever it is, right? I mean, it's, it's the, the level of increased ease and assurance of having IBC. It's like, yeah, okay, you got to get the relayers up. The difference in assurance you get in IBC such that we do things on a daily or weekly basis that are, oh my gosh, exciting on other infrastructures is just amazing. And so the first basis is the level of security of IBC is just way up here by comparison with most other things. Now, there's plenty more that we can do and that people are working on to partly at the app chain layer, partly at the transfer layer, all those kinds of stuff. But it's really important to, to recognize where it's at that it, it enables us all to build app chains and kind of proceed about our business and participate in a much larger, larger ecosystem than ourselves. And because we can participate, we can do these more focused app chains. And then those combinations are really powerful. And again, it then pulls you into a world where now we've succeeded at app chains. What's the next phase? The next phase is going to be built largely on IBC. And I think one thing to remember as well is we're not just defending against specific hackers that try to steal our funds, right? In the end, we built crypto to be nation state resilient an intro protocol that runs on an oracle supported by the US or a multi-six set cannot supply like the services to everyone. They can be stopped by the SEC, by the NSA. Really at the moment, IBC is the only protocol out there that is nation state resilient, which means that if you're building a privacy chain, for example, like Penumbra, IBC really is the only solution that you can use right now for your intro. Other intro providers might be blocked by the US government or whatever other agency out there. I think for the crypto ethos itself, it's important that IBC is the standard if you really want to uh, bank the unbanked. Very cool. So we're kind of talking right now about how chains, app chains are talking to each other through IBC. So this kind of touches on that. So how can app chains ensure interoperability with other blockchain networks through IBC while, maybe more importantly, maintaining the integrity and sovereignty of their own chains? I mean, that's if we build it in the IBC protocol itself. It's, I think, one of the most sovereign intro protocols. It isolates risks between individual chains, so it does not have an overarching risk across the entire network. If we ever have a um, chain itself, have a corrupted validator set, for example, that's isolated to that chain and the connections to that chain. It doesn't go further than that. Um, on top of that, what I think we'll see in the future is more ZK IBC, including proof aggregation. What that will allow us to do is have every single chain connected to every other chain and removes the need for bridge hubs or kind of aggregation chains themselves. Right now, that's probably the biggest kind of pitfall in Interop itself. We kind of cluster around hubs, Osmosis and such. And although Osmosis is a great product, if it were to ever disappear, it'd be quite disastrous for most app chains out there. And thus, we kind of need to ensure that in the future of the app chain thesis, everything is truly connected to everything, not just a few highways, but a dense network. Yeah, so I think what I was, um, only thing I would add is like, like, I think ZK is great and we really want to support it. I think also something that we're working on is just kind of having more shared security also means you can have shared commitments and that kind of gives you this optimistic slash ZK flavor of, of things as well. And so that's also something that we're, we're working on and trying to, to push forward in the space as well is just different ways to make credible commitments across different IBC channels. Yeah, I think the one downside of that approach, um, it works great if your validator set is also renting this, but renting out security to support your interop itself, it's kind of a losing game for the interop protocol because as volume grows, you continuously need to rent more security from your provider and that leads to higher fees to end users. If your validator set is already on it, it works fine and it's great. But if you're only doing this to secure the bridging operations itself, it kind of leads to a losing game and you really can't beat out ZK then, which always has the lowest fees. So Agoric has long had a vision of multiple machines cooperating with secure protocols where blockchain are just machines built out of agreement rather than silicon. One of the points that Sonny made earlier today in his presentation is one of the values of app chains is you can experiment on how you secure that chain, right? You can get interchain security, you, you know, like, like Neutron. You can work on mesh security so you can share subsets of validator states. You can do zero knowledge things. You can do other things, you know, Babylon gives you um, uh, Bitcoin security to secure your, secure your chain, and they're bridging to chains like Agoric to add that to existing chains in a, in a positive some way, right? So, so that ability to, to have a sovereign chain that other people treat as an actor over secure protocols and can cooperate with up to the limits they're willing to, to trust it or that users on their chain are willing to trust the services there, right? That ability to experiment and evolve is one of the superpowers of the Cosmos ecosystem, again, enabled by, by, by um, IBC. It's also just 
really a superpower of that vision of sovereign entities connected to secure protocols. And so from a, from a vision point of view, I mean, interchain isn't just IBC. Interchain is anything connected through any kind of mechanism. So over, you know, Gravity Bridge, Axelar, Wormhole, whatever it is, those provide additional connections to make a true interchain out to systems that are running completely different infrastructures. And yet we can do, we can, we can reach that liquidity, we can reach those assets, and we can start to build programs that, that you know, and user abstractions that, that deliver value across all those ecosystems in, in one thing because of this, this interoperability that really the Cosmos ecosystem led the charge on a couple of years ago. Um, you kind of got ahead of me on that, talking about interoperability with other chains. This guy, he's on fire today. So I only have a couple more questions before we hit the lightning round, so I hope you guys are excited for that. You all right over there? Um, so yeah, a couple more questions, and then we'll open it up here, see if maybe there's some questions from the audience. But um, what trade-offs need to be considered when designing the best mechanism to integrate IBC beyond Cosmos, which is kind of what you were mentioning here? Yeah, I mean, I think there's there's a lot, and we can get into um, a lot of them. I think the the biggest one is really not compromising on the the base level of security, and like really what we've talked about here, and um, Carol kind of talked about it earlier, is basically this idea that if you have an IBC connection between two chains, like if one of them is secured by two validators, like it doesn't really it's it's as secure as that, at least for that uh, leg of the connection. And so I think the main thing that we want to work on, and I mean, talking my book a little bit with Ethos, is like we can share the security across the ecosystem and get more of a uniform layer of security across all of your connected counterparties. Um, and I think that's kind of what we want to push towards. I think there's a few other trade-offs. Um, I'll, I'll object to what he said, just for uh, contrary and entertainment value. The internet, you know, internet is not all HTTPS. The internet was a connected set of networks that all had different protocols, and they had different security characteristics. You, you know, eventually, I mean, now TLS is everywhere. Right, and that's all you would use. But there was a long period of transition where, yeah, I can only get to something over, you know, uh, uh, broadcast mechanisms on a bulletin board. I can only get to something over Genie. I can only, get, and it was good to connect those, right? So even though multi-sig bridges suck from a security point of view, that's still part of the interchain. And what we need is to make sure we have protocols where. We are bounding how much we use them from a risk point of view. We are sensitive to the risk, but we include them. You know, now there's a lot of brilliant engineering in IBC, which you know, IBC was really combined the ideas of TCP with best practices that people had already developed. And you know, and people have now carried some of those ideas forward into other protocols that we want to bridge with. Most of which are you know inherit some of the security architecture of of of, of IBC, but some don't. We probably still want to look at connecting with them just as long as we can manage that risk explicitly and in plan. Now, the counter argument is, of course, yeah, but TCP, when it first started out, didn't have money, right? And so as soon as you bring money to the table, now suddenly your baseline of what you should expect goes way up. From my perspective, it goes up above all of the multi sig bridges, and it's what we're doing right now in some of those places is crazy. <laughs> I would just like to say on this thing uh, TLS everywhere. Let's encrypt, multi-sig bridges are on the way out, and consensus verification, ZK, IBC, and IBC in general, I think it's going to go to every single ecosystem. It'll be part of the journey, of course, that we have multi-sig bridges and other interop solutions, but the end solution for Wormhole, Layer Zero, Polyhedra, etc., everything is going towards live clients and ZK live clients. I think besides the security, um, there's also a really big question on which standards will uh, be used, and also at what layer of abstraction that these standards will um, will exist. Uh, because what we see with like uh, I see as 20 tokens um, is that, for example, if I want to do a transfer of a token on another chain, if I do that through an IBC packet, I need to know the denomination of that asset on the other chain. So, and you know, if we scale to a lot of uh, IBC chains, then this becomes like a data availability problem. Like, how do you address a certain asset on another chain? And those are questions that we will practically run into once we have the, the foundational um, pipelines made. Cool. Um, all right, one final question before lightning round, and if we have time, maybe audience questions. So think of something you'd like to ask these guys. Is Galaxy Brains up here? Um, this is kind of on your own project. So are there any future developments we can expect from your protocols to further support the interoperability and seamless integration of blockchains through IBC? 
yeah, I, I hinted at it already. I think there, there's a lot of things that we have in the works. We're a little early, so we're not revealing too much right now. But essentially, along this line of having a shared coordination layer across validators allows you to make commitments across these chains. There's a lot of interesting things there. Um, for us, we leverage a lot of the, the base capability in IBC, so interchain accounts, ICQ. All of those can improve a lot in the same way that HTTP was, you know, was powerful and yet very limited. We're, we're just at the beginning of the protocols that we want to be able to rely on. Being able to, from a smart contract on Agoric, manage asynchronous assets over, across, across not just IBC connected chains, but you know, GMP and XR and everything else, that's, that's the goal that needs fundamental uh, you know, abilities that are accessible over the chain, and everyone will benefit from them, right? You know, abstract and, and sommelier and you know, all these things that can reach out and do something on another chain. We all really want to empower that, right? You built your app chain, it's got an asset. You're not an island, or you shouldn't be. Your asset or your service is much more valuable if the rest of that explosion of chains and services can reach it and drive it and tickle it and run it through its paces. And then we can build much, much more usable applications to deliver to users that, that where they don't have to deal with all this multi-chain stuff. They don't have to manually carry their asset from chain to chain, which is amazing that IBC enables, and yet users don't want to do it anyway. They want that all to be handled for them. And that's what and all the next stage of evolution is how do we make it so that you can program that? And that's that's why we're so focused on orchestration is make all this stuff even more valuable to users. Yeah, I, uh, I definitely agree with the ethos uh, that Agoric is going for. Um, with Abstract, we uh, are trying to go maybe a level higher. Uh, we're trying to build interchain applications. Uh, and that, that means that the application isn't just on one chain and talking to the other chains. It means that the application, the single binary, is on all the chains and it communicates with itself. It's kind of like a mesh application over uh, different IBC chains. Um, so that's like what one of our developments. Uh, the other thing that we're really working on is developer tooling. So we have this scripting deployment library uh, that's called CW Orchestrator. Uh, we have put immense effort into uh, making it very easy to test Wasm smart contracts in interchain environments. Um, so if you're interested in that, feel free to hit me up after this. Um, yeah. Yeah, for us, it's um, expect IBC to more ecosystems. Uh, expect it to any Polygon CDK rollup. Expect it on any Sovereign slash chat L2. Anything that's running in the Avail ecosystem. Basically, the Cosmos is no longer going to be the Cosmos SDK. The Cosmos is going to be any single horizontally scaled ecosystem, all supported by IBC. That means you guys need to start hiring not just Cosmosm developers, but a lot more developers for different languages. And Ethos needs to start supporting a lot of different types of validators, not just Cosmos validators. Cool. So I don't think we'll have time for audience questions, but we do have a lightning round time. So this one's an easy one. Softball, pizza, burgers, or tacos? Pizza. 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 Burgers. Pizza. Sorry, you got, you're out, burgers. You're out. <laughs> um, all right. This one goes back to how we started this conversation. Describe IBC in only one word. Interchain count? Interconnectivity. Good one. Security. Money. <laughs> I like money. Uh, and then my final lightning round question, IBC for app chains panel. Amazing panel or fantastic panel? Giga panel. Base panel. <laughs> All right, I think that's about all the time we have. Give a big round of applause for our panelists. Thank you all for joining. Hope you guys learned something I did. Big shout out to Dora Hacks and uh, enjoy Eat Denver. Good stuff. There you go, out.